Dr. Steve James. Welcome to Shoreditch. John, thanks for having me. This has uh, been a long time coming. It has indeed. It's yeah. been some months. Things have happened. Um, yeah, so I think I got in touch with you just after that infamous video. You're basically the reason we don't have mandates, aren't you? No, I don't think that's the, I'm the reason. I just <laughs> was just there at a time when things were turning and, you know, maybe my interview helped shift things at the time. Yeah. I, I, do you know what? I remember seeing, I remember watching it and I was like, this is a changing point. Mm. This is like a, it, you, you were like, you were like common sense coming from the stars. It was like a, like a bombshell of common sense. It's like, well, if you give, give us a booster every month, like eventually we're going to die probably, you know, and it doesn't make any sense. You can't boost everyone every month. Like I remember watching it thinking this is like what, what we needed. And um, I remember what's his name, Sadiq, um, just like such a politician. It was like unbelievable. So th I want to say thank you for that video. Um, it was unbelievable. Um, and uh, how has it all changed since since doing that? Because you, you were, you know, doctor, doing his thing, you know, and yeah. then all of a sudden, one interview, not even an interview, you're just talking and someone had a camera. Yeah. What's changed? Um, mandates? <laughs> well, well m mandates have changed. Yeah. Um, you know, we've gone through a period of time now where it's become okay to raise questions and that's what was missing so i was one of the first people whose voice uh i suppose would be considered not not someone who'd be dismissed automatically yeah dismissed by some when it happened but not automatically by the majority of the population and uh what i said like you said resonated with a lot of people i mean i had thousands of people get in touch and say i thought i was going mad until i heard you say it and yeah. i realized i wasn't on my own so a lot of people who were on their own didn't have contact with anybody else who felt like that were quite isolated. A lot of people who were, you know, in groups were like, okay, we're, you know, we're going to be okay. This is going to sort of wash through. Yeah. Um, and then we've seen people against it and then there was a lot of protests in the next sort of months or so. And I think the government realised it was just, at least the NHS vaccine mandate was was too big a thing to push through but it was a battle it's not the whole war um how long ago was that video four or five months that was yeah six sixth of january six of january yeah yeah so six months just over six months it, it's weird because i haven't been vaccinated um because i just felt like i'm healthy mm. and i'm yeah. not 83 <laughs> or whatever the average age of um you know and uh i've traveled the whole time you know, like completely travelled everywhere except America. For some reason, you still can't go to America. No, it's yeah. like weirdest thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I just you know, for me, I I was never I I just didn't believe what was being said. You know, we had a quick chat just before, and I didn't want to ask you anything before because I was excited to talk to you. Um, but I felt like the whole time it was just one big commercial. It was like um, it, my background's like advertising marketing and you know, you use strap lines to get people in. Yeah. And the strap line was, um, protect the, what was it? Protect the NHS, stay at home. And save lives. Yeah. Which actually doesn't make sense because protecting the NHS, like you said. Well, the NHS is supposed to be there to protect you. Right. But if you haven't funded it for a long time, and that was a big problem in the UK, yeah. we had a much lower ratio of intensive care beds, for example, to the population compared with other countries. Yeah. So we were maxed out very quickly. Yeah. So... How, have they not been funding because I'm like just a normal person you know we're all normal people yeah just kind of <laughs> as in my knowledge just kind of like I know, I, I know about like money and business and yeah. stuff but when it comes to like you know I mean I remember seeing the XL you know and they were like building like what was it 4,000 beds or something ridiculous yeah. and they never used it no I mean it was always going to be what are you going to use the Nightingale hospitals for because where how are you going to staff it yeah you know, and, and if you're going to have just ventilated patients there, not many of the patients needed just the ventilator. They needed the input of other services. They needed filters for their kidneys. They needed lots of other things. Yeah. So we had a shortage of staff in the hospitals. No one really knew how you're supposed to staff it outside. But if it had become much bigger, we might have been thankful for it. So it's a, it's a bit of a tricky one. Yeah. But we didn't. No, we didn't. None of them. No, but we were literally creating the bed spaces day by day 
yeah. to be able to manage the number of patients that were coming in. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was scared everyone though. It yeah. kept people at home, didn't it? It did, and then for a couple of weeks, you know, stay away. Let's let's let people focus on what on earth is going on here. Yeah, that that I can understand that. You know, a response for a couple of weeks of you know freeze. You know, yeah. if you think about that sort of rest and digest, fight or flight, freeze and fawn process. Yeah, it's like yeah. bloody hell. We don't know what's going on. Can everyone just stay still, and we'll just see what we can work out. But to continue that on for years, two years, yeah, on and off, re-traumatizing people, very strange. Yeah, because originally it was stay at home for three weeks, flatten the curve, and protect the hospitals, right? Mm-hmm. Don't over overrun them, yeah, right. And then that that everyone was like sick, three week holiday. We're gonna. Just it was chill sunny. Out. It was good weather. Let's go to the garden. Netflix. There's so much catch up on Netflix. <laughs> it was great weather. I remember it, was it being super like weather, really yeah. good weather. Yeah. I was like doing workouts at home, CrossFit on Zoom and stuff. And then like the three weeks were over, and then like, oh my god, how did it turn into two years? I, 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 if if you were to if an alien came here, I was saying earlier, if an alien came here and you told them what happened in the last two years, they wouldn't buy it. I don't think. I don't think they'd buy it. It depends how how susceptible they were to the language that was used. Depends who tol- tells them the story. The yeah. politician. It's, um, it's completely believable because many people believed it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying many people believe the story that the government presented. Yeah, and the pharmaceutical companies and the other regulatory authorities presented, and there was a problem. So when you get people who are saying it didn't happen or yeah. the virus doesn't exist. Or it's all fake. Yeah. Of course, people are going to step back and go, "Well, I lost a relative, and yeah. this happened, and the intensive cares were full." And people think that it was just just a flu, uh, and that it was just a normal patient, normal patient population who was in at that time of year. It wasn't at all. I mean, it completely affects patients' bodies in a very characteristic way. Yeah. That is de- very definitely not something else. So when I see patients who've come up, we started to see this towards the end of the pandemic, that patients would present. We were told they're COVID positive. They had a respiratory problem. We'd look at their chest X-ray or CT scan and we go, "Oh, that doesn't actually look like COVID. It's probably coincidental COVID." It's just very clear because yeah. you can see the different different patterns on the chest. Yeah. Okay. Before we go, like, yeah. randomly talk. So, because like, I'll have to steer this because otherwise, I, there's so much to talk about, and you're like the best person to ever talk to about it because you literally <laughs> you were in charge of a COVID ward, right? Yeah. So yeah. not at that time. Uh, yeah. I was later on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, First question, who's made the most money out of COVID? It's not me or the public. That's no, for it's sure. definitely not. <laughs> We've lost a fortune. So you've like, got to think it's the pharmaceutical companies Yeah, as, as, a, as a net difference. And, you know, you're thinking about money all the time. I just think, okay, if you look at a question, who we you know, follow the money, which side is the money on? It's usually a pretty good indicator of who to be suspicious of, right? And you can apply it to loads of different things. And COVID is what I'm asking now. <laughs> How do we apply? Yeah. So, so the answer is, is what everyone knows. It, it's like, yeah, it's like follow the money and you're, you know, you're, that'll find your answer. So it, if pharmaceuticals have made billions and billions and billions out of it, um, well, they, are they part of it? Because obviously that you've got, you got the WHO, mm-hmm. yeah, World Health Organization, and I've heard that there's a, a new World Health Council. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not not aware of that. Th- th- that's what they're proposing. I think, yeah, yeah, it's like an actual bunch of legit doctors like doing it. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you heard about it? Is it called the World World Health Council WHC? No, I've heard about it. Say, so I don't. Okay. Know. Um, don't know much about it, so I won't, I won't go into it. But um, but yeah, so you have got the WHO. And then, oh God, I've got so many things running through my brain. I was about to go, what do you think of Bill Gates? But we'll get, we'll get onto that. Like, I don't even, you know, I know, right? Cringe, like, literally. Did you see this interview, this 92Y interview? No. Oh, it turns your stomach. I mean, if you just, if you just watch it without the sound on, because I found it difficult to watch with him speaking, just watching the body language, yeah? So he's, you know, he's foot tapping, you know, he's moving his foot around. He, he's uncomfortable being where he is. Yeah. He's saying, he's, he's using his hands to indicate high but he's saying low so there's a complete mismatch between what he's doing and what he's saying yeah he's touching his face which is classic for you know i i can't be trusted i'm i'm misrepresenting yeah things uncomfortable his, his or oh, his, just watching his body language was 
It was quite disturbing. It, how, which interview is this? It's called 92Y. And was it on a news channel? Um, no, it's a New York cultural centre. Uh, okay. And you can see it on uh, on their website. And there are clips of it on Rumble and a few other places. The one that I saw initially on YouTube has been taken down. I have a, you know Ivor Cummins? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He did a little presentation on it from uh, some comedian who'd done an analysis of it. That's where I first saw it. But uh, Okay. So it's 92Y, yeah. Interview of Bill Gates. Yeah. Need to watch that. Yeah. Okay, I'll watch that. I wish I watched that beforehand. Um, I mean, that guy is just creepy as fuck. It's like, excuse my French, but he's so creepy. Like, it's actually worrying. And he's now just saying, oh, we found out it, 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 um, it doesn't have such a high mortality and, uh, you know, the effectiveness of things. It's, it's quite... It's... Yeah. It's crazy. He, he's now catching back up and saying, "Yeah, we knew this sort of things." So he's trying to, you know, remodel himself. Marketing. It's it's <laughs> just the most bizarre. I, I literally <laughs> can't get my head around how much chaos, like, has happened. And it's like the lockdown, the long term effects. It's crazy. One of the things he said we talked about was the um, negative effects on school children, uh, and he said, you know, that that kids are sort of you know, up to two years behind uh, as a deficit. Yeah. Uh, in um, the inner cities, yeah. uh, less so in the suburban areas. And then he goes on to say, and in private schools where my children is, there's almost no difference. I think <laughs> I saw that. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you can't write it, can you? Mm. How is this happening? This is like mind-blowing. Okay, so so going back to the money thing, because we'll, we'll, cause we'll, we'll mm-hmm. sway otherwise. There's too many th- things that are laughable that you're just going to pop into our heads. So going back to the money thing, pharmaceutical money that made like an absolute fortune. So it's in their interest to yeah, like jab everybody. Hold us, let's, let's, uh, yeah. Right? That's the, it's in their interest to jab everybody. Fourth boosters, all this kind of stuff. Like what you said in that video, hit, hit on the head for everyone, especially me. I was like, you know, it, it, you get the jab, you get a double jab, then you get a booster. And then it's like, how are they going to manage travel? It doesn't, it, there's no logic to any of it. Um, so I'm glad I didn't get anything. Um, but all these jabs... They've done that. And I saw uh, Peter McCulloch shared something on Twitter. It was a video of a, um, a really, really well-known doctor. And he was saying that if you actually have the jab, is it true, to, right, what he said? He said, if you actually have the jab, it's worse for you than if you don't have the jab now, based on the data. And that was the data from uh, Israel and UK. He was basing that on. So the what they're saying then was that the admission rates... Uh, two hospital were higher in the uh, uh, vaccinated rather than the unvaccinated population. Mm-hmm. Now, we don't have a proper control group running that shows that the vaccinated and the unvaccinated groups are the same, just that people chose to, w- to have the vaccine or not to have the vaccine. Mm-hmm. So were the people who, who chose not to have it all those who are slightly more interested in health? And you've got what's called the healthy user bias. And is that, an, is that enough to make it different? And then you've got the crossover issue so once you're vaccinated once you've had a a jab inoculation you're not vaccinated until some weeks after your second um uh, jab yeah so if you have a complication in in the period between your first and your second and then the two weeks afterwards you're counted as unvaccinated does that is that actually like how it is or are they using that so they can skew the data well if you don't set it up i mean the weird thing is we are currently experiencing the largest medical experiment in human history, but it's not an experiment because we're not actually running the study. Yeah. So we've, <laughs> we've, we've <laughs> inoculated, what, a billion people, and we haven't got a control group. And one of the things is, you know, they've been trying to push it so that everyone's vaccinated, so then you can't compare it, can you? And how, how can you go back and compare it? Who's your control person who's the person who's you know who's your twin brother who's who's not had it who's living a similar life there isn't there isn't one and that's just that's just ridiculous so you know the the Pfizer study what was it 40,000 people um it was supposed to run for three years and then they released the data after what two uh, two two months of follow-up um you had eight people in the vaccinated group who who'd tested positive after having symptoms tested positive for the virus um, and then uh, 160 in the unvaccinated group and that's they then after that allowed the pe- they unblinded and they told the people who were unvaccinated they could have the vaccine and your control group's lost 
It's just like, and who ran the study, Pfizer, obviously? Yeah, that was Pfizer. And most of the authors on the paper, I think it was 84% of the authors, had financial ties to Pfizer. Now, a company is supposed to make money. You know that, right? Yeah. It has a duty to its shareholders to try and maximise profits. Yeah. Pfizer's got a history of doing that. It's also got a history of breaking the rules. Yeah. So why on earth are governments and the regulatory agencies not saying, hey, hang on a minute, it's all right if you present this data, but there should have been some independent people involved in assessing it. Yeah. And why have you done this and that? And if you've, if you've studied it in a healthy population, okay, but how many people, how many people died in that two-month two period? None. Yeah? So let's not apply it now and say it's safe for everyone. Yeah. Safe. If, if I give you a, you know, a car and say, well, we've tested it for two years and it didn't, didn't break down or explode, it doesn't mean that f- as far as you're concerned it's a safe car. You want to know it's been tested as long as you're basically going to have that car for, yeah, but yeah, it's not yeah. going to do something. Yeah. So safe basically means without identifiable risk as far as that person's concerned. Yeah. But the vaccines weren't studied long enough. And you compare that to an active one, so where people are expected to fill in some or respond to an app or something that says, have you got any symptoms today? Yes, one, yeah. So when you do that, you get a pretty high response for people having problems with the vaccine. Yeah. And if you just do a passive system, you get almost zero. So, you know, you can't say that this yellow card system or this VAERS system, you can't say how, it, how below the actual effect it is but it's significantly below. I mean, multitudes. Um, how many people have died since having the vaccine? Do you know? From the vaccine? Mm-hmm. No, I don't. Um, I think the numbers reported were, when I looked like a few months ago, around 2,000 in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard. It's hard to know what the numbers are. Um, it may be much higher because a lot of people don't want to recognise the vaccine could be dangerous. So you'll see other problems. So, you know, how, how do you as a doctor know that someone has had this problem because of the vaccine? When, let's say, you know, if, if more than 90% of the population over 75 have had the vaccine and someone shows up with uh, an issue that you see before vaccines exist... How are you going to know if the vaccine is related? Because the vast majority of the population have had that. How are you going to tell? Well, it's a bit like saying, how can you tell that they die from COVID when they've got four comorbidities and all these other things? It's so like, it's, how can you... So that's, that's easier. So to put on a death certificate, you put down why someone died. So you yeah. put down respiratory failure. You would then say why they had the respiratory failure and you'd yeah. say it was COVID-19. Yeah. And if it wasn't COVID-19 that actually did that, you wouldn't put it down. So I think most of my, so some people would probably put COVID or some doctors might put COVID-19 if it was coincidental with the patient, but mostly it was being put down because people, because patients had COVID-19 and it was causing the disease, you know, COVID is a disease, it's not a virus, yeah? So when you've got the disease, that's the, the, the process in the body and if you've died from it, you put that down. Now... I think the, 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 the CDC said in the US, and it's very similar here, that uh, 75% of patients had four or more comorbidities, yeah. Yeah? which means that the other 25%, they had three or two. I yeah. didn't see a single patient in the entire time who didn't have a comorbidity. And sometimes when patients were presented and I was told they didn't have any past medical history, you check and you go, well, actually, if we look through in this history, they've got this this, this problem here, or yeah. actually they're obese um, and their BMI is 35, but we haven't said they're obese. So there was there was always an issue. that I didn't see anybody who, who was healthy uh, who had COVID-19 on intensive care. doesn't mean they didn't happen, but I didn't see it. How many, so how many people actually died of COVID-19 in the UK? Uh, do you actually think, like as a guesstimate based on all your knowledge and stuff, um, I can't pull the figures out of my head today. Um, silly, isn't it? How many people were supposed to have died of it? Like, so let me, let me think now. It, it isn't it in the region of one hundred and 
fifty thousand, and there was this. Um, good, Connor's going to look it up for us. Connor's going to look. Yeah. <laughs> there was so there's this big question about how many patients um, uh, o- died only of COVID nineteen. Yeah. yeah, and you'll see people saying, "Oh, the Office of National Statistics put out this figure that said it was seventeen thousand. Okay, yeah, that's not the true picture because. That was 17,000 people who had nothing else written on their death certificate to say there was a significant other medical problem that contributed. So out of that 17,000 people, um, some of them had medical problems that weren't identified. Some had medical problems that weren't identified, were identified, but weren't thought to contribute towards COVID-19. Yeah, towards the death of that patient. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, you had arthritis uh, and um, diverticulitis, two inflammatory conditions, which might well have predisposed you to a serious consequence of COVID-19. But because the people filling out the death certificate thought, well, arthritis and um, diverticular disease aren't really related to you having a lung, uh, uh, lung respiratory failure, yeah. we won't put it down on the death certificate. So there were 17,000 people where the death certificate didn't identify anything else. So it could have been less. Um, no, no, but, but it's not people who died from COVID-19 it's people who died from COVID-19 without any other health problems identified but they could have had more pro- they could have had problems yeah they could still have had problems so but there's other people who, who, who did have other comorbidities and died so people think that so if you take that sort of 150 odd thousand it's got the number? reported here just under 180,000 deaths in the okay. United Kingdom right. so if you take the 180 yeah, and you take out that, let's call it 18 now, yeah, who didn't have anything else on, the, on their death certificate. You've got 162,000. Those people had other comorbidities. It doesn't mean they didn't die from COVID yeah. because most people who die in hospital and die in general have other yeah. health problems because it's yeah. that c- accumulation of chronic disease that tends to lead yeah, to your yeah, susceptibility yeah. and yeah. that's when you die. So the reality is we actually don't know how many people died of COVID. So when you say died of COVID, do you mean died because COVID came along? Yeah. Yeah. I think that the 180,000 isn't far off it. Really? Yeah. Interesting. If you, like, looking back now... Be but two and a half. lot of those people would have died. That's the other thing. It's a lot of people, those people probably would have died within six months to a year of anyway. them dying from COVID. So they died earlier. Right. But whether they died... So if you mem- remember the average age we talked about at the beginning... I think it was 84 or 85 that people died of COVID and the right. life expectancy in this country is 83. Yeah. So the, the vast majority of people who were dying were very much the elderly. Yeah, so yeah. you'd expect that that population, a large chunk of those people, would anyway die in the next couple of years. Right. So yeah. if you died, you know, to a, a month earlier than you're expected to, you'd still say that you died from COVID. Yeah. But the, the way they communicated this was not mm. it's just not i remember <laughs> i remember i actually something. posted something on instagram and it was probably like may 2020 and um it was uh, like so the lady that was like talking whatever she they were like how are you calculating it and it was like anyone that dies that tests for covid19 is a covid death and i was like that's not correct you can't be Sorry, doing, yeah. you can't be doing that so there is there is a difference between those who had covid-19 on their death certificate at all and i think it's more like 130,000 out of the 180,000 so there were some who'd been identified as having who were like you said but the majority of those who died with covid-19 on their death certificate so doctors got to write out the death certificate yeah yeah um that that's over 100,000 people yeah um but Weren't the hospitals getting cash for everyone that they... I heard in America they were getting like 30 grand a person for everyone they identified with COVID. Yeah. So, you know, the US healthcare system is the model you don't want <laughs> in many ways because yeah. you're incentivized to... to Lie. Yes, but you know, by identifying and offering treatment, which you would in general say is fine as long as the person is not unscrupulous the, yeah. the, they get a financial return for the work they do yeah. um but people like to make money don't they i mean in america <laughs> my friend my friend dana from america he lives in costa rica now but when we talk about america he's like every man for himself yeah that's how he describes yeah. it yeah. There. it's yeah. like yeah. everyone they're like cowboys it's like they'll yeah. shoot you 
you know, in a second. And like when it comes to money, I just don't care. But in the UK, did hospitals get money for like not per patient and not per diagnosis? Though. No, it's got not ten to get a bonus. Like how it work? No. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> just round them up. I mean, I, <laughs> I I do see within healthcare a lot of problems, but yeah. I don't see uh, really any relationship in the NHS between consultants choosing to do those things and making money. It's it's just not set up like that. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now looking back, like two and a half years on, should we have even had a lockdown? Not more than a couple of weeks, no. I, th- I, I you know, this great bound <laughs> declaration, I said it from the beginning uh, as well. We should be isolating, protecting the vulnerable. Yeah. You should isolate those who are symptomatic. You should wash your hands more regularly. Which you should do anyway. She should do anyway, but fo- focus on it. Bit of bit of government messaging on that. Well, that would have been okay. Be a bit cleaner, everyone. Yeah. Like. yeah. <laughs> and don't make restrictions on travel, which is what all the old pandemic plans said. Yeah. And they just threw the threw the book out and went, oh, let's do this differently. Is there any way they can justify it now, based on everything we know now and all the studies that have come that have come out and probably will come out in the next couple of years? Is there any way they can look back and justify what they did? And I'm not even talking about side effects, you know, people with mental health problems, you know, the economy turning to shit. Just the lockdown. Is there any way they can justify just a lockdown? The answer, I can see the answer is no. Justify it. It's a tricky, I mean, how to put that in the same sentence as politician. Um, It's just, they're scum, aren't they? They're absolute scumbags. Well, I mean, you the know, thing is, know, politicians are we, just... Uh, we've also... We are responsible as a society for the society that we are in to yeah. a fair extent. Yeah. Um, I don't like... What, what, so one of the things I felt uncomfortable with was once you start to identify something that's problematic in society, people then start to attribute responsibility there and remove responsibility from themselves. Yeah? And that makes you weak. That means makes you a victim. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, someone else wants to go along and rescue the people who are the victims and go, oh, so-and-so is terrible. And, you know, you're in this big ego trip, this sort of, you know, triangle between these different positions that people play. You, you've got to stop there and say, okay, let, let's, let's create the right solution. Let's talk about what the right thing is to do. We can identify it, but don't, don't bang on about it and don't expect the people who are also caught up in their system. So, you know, if you're if you're born into a family where, let's say, you're going to get educated in a certain way and you're going to get some privileged access... Boris. Yeah, yeah, you know, most of the politicians, yeah. Then, um, you know, are we going to blame them for, for, for not breaking out of their golden chains yeah. and saying, I, I won't have this? Yeah. You know. I mean... Yeah, I mean, they, they, it's like part of the Matrix, isn't it? They're just part of the Matrix. They don't, don't know any different. No, they don't know any they, different. They're just, you know... Um, well, some of them do. Some of them do. Some of them... I mean, who? People. Tony Blair? No. no. Like, I mean, like... Uh, who are the, who are the good examples? Worse? No, the thing is, is that how could you, as a, as, as a honest person, progress through the political system? It'd be extremely difficult, wouldn't it? I mean, who's around now who who went through when there wasn't enough influence, who's potentially statesman-like? I mean... Um, Nobody that I can think of. I mean, Brady, the um, 1922 committee leader, Graham Brady, he he looks to me like someone who's got a bit of, I'm not swayed by it all, I can just do what I think is the right thing. So if it comes to a, an election, then I think that... Well, not an election, um, a leadership contest for the Conservatives, and that's going to happen, isn't it, in the next six months? I mean, Boris is pretty good at ignoring stuff, but... Uh, I mean, I saw a video of, of him he's about going. he's had, like, seven kids, five five women were married at the time when he got them pregnant. I, I mean, like, it's just mad. But the thing is, like, media, you know, you know, it, it's not how it used to be. Like, how no. old are you? 48. 48, I'm 41, so similar. Um... But when we were like, say, 18, it was like, there was like one, it was five channels on TV. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, I mean, you had bit, you had cable, but it was like The Simpsons, you know, and then 10 minute free view at 12 o'clock. <laughs> I remember that crap. <laughs> but, um, 
But yeah, so like for us, we had one, like five channels, not even five. Channel five was like the worst thing in the world. So no one watched that. It was like, you're weird if you watch that. So you had like four channels. Mm. And what I remember with Tony Blair, I, th- I remember they put a story out of him playing guitar and I thought he was cool. <laughs> so, and like, you know, you, d- you didn't know anything else. So he it was like, he was he, slick. Yeah. yeah, it was just was all PR thought. rubbish. And then I saw that Rupert Murdoch documentary. Do you see that? The three part. That mm, was really different. clever about how he basically had Tony Blair in his pocket mm. and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then, but I feel like that, where people get their news, I mean, I don't watch the news anymore. I don't think young people watch the news. You know, yeah. it's like, so I do have hope for the future. Um, but then if, you know, I'm just a side note here, but like you look at the election in America last year and you've seen that documentary about the ballots, how they've like got film evidence of people like stuffing ballots. Yes. Like it, so even if you think there's hope, you know, they can, can they still, it's like, what, what can we, what can we done? Like, re- well, really? See, I, I mean, I, I think the internet is the threat to the people who've currently got power because it does allow the transfer of information and the coordination of people who want to change the system. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I think is probably going on is there's a sort of, there's a bit of a power grab going because people are sensing that the system is can potentially develop in a way that allows revolution, evolution uh, of the system. With people saying, you know, in numbers we can change things. Yeah. And people don't quite realise the potential of that. And the governments are trying to, you know, put in place certain controls now that will stop those things, that stop that potential freedom from happening. Yeah, I, I think because they're so slow at doing that. I don't. It's like Canada when they did that Emergency Act law, you know, where they uh, froze people's bank mm-hmm. accounts. Like the whole world was like, no, nah, you can't be doing that. But, and they, I was like, but they did for a minute. But this is why Bitcoin is going to save everyone. You know, this is what's going to happen. Like, I think something like twenty five percent of people in America have Bitcoin. Really? You know? Yeah. So, and that's a lot of young people, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, in the future, we won't. We won't. We talked we talk about money briefly before this, didn't we? And we were, we were like, it's a system that you can't opt out of. But Bitcoin is a system that you can, where you can use Bitcoin all over the world, cost you nothing to transfer money or value. Um, and I feel like that'll be the system that everyone wants to use in the future. And then from that, if there's no, if they can't, if they control the money, government, central banks, um, but they don't control the money, then what? Like you can't you can't manipulate people, you can't control anybody, it'll be a whole different system. And I feel like, th- this is the only thing, it's like, I feel like this is going to take 20 to 40 years to change. And it's, I, I kind of wish I was born now so that I didn't have to live through that time. Does that make sense? Our yeah, time. I'm not, I'm not sure. It's definitely going to be a difficult time. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I, I felt that we'd peaked already 10, 20 years ago. And I felt there's a decline coming. Yeah. Um, I feel there's likely to be a lot of disruption in the next 20 years to the yeah. way we live. Yeah. And I don't see it as, a, as really a smooth, easy route out. A lot, a lot of people are struggling yeah. with their health, with their finances. I mean, you hear about it as a you know, BBC News story. You think, you know, the way it's kind of... It, it, it doesn't convey the scale... Of uh, of difficulty people have in their daily life. No, it's, it's you know when you see it with with patients. Do you, do you think COVID was a power grab? Part of the power grab. Part of the what? Sorry. Power grab. I mean, it makes sense. It was suppo- what I heard is it was supposed to happen in twenty twenty five. And it just happened to be a bit of a lab leak too early. But they yeah, and then they were like I, unorganized. They were like, it's getting bad. The internet. We're basically AI in flesh, aren't we? Yeah. The more you see, the more you ask questions, the more worrying the behaviours of people are in yeah. their own financial interest. My my opinion is everything's planned. I don't do anything that's not planned, really. And you know, if if you're controlling, if you're a central bank mm-hmm. and you want to control everybody, like they're talking about central bank digital currencies. 
it's that hasn't just come up that's been planned for like 10 no, years for at sure. least so so it's like how do they implement that how do they con- you know, control all the media how do they implement all this kind of stuff you know and then as soon as you say something right against the government it's misinformation or as we were talking about malinformation yeah. malinformation yeah so malinformation is when you give so it's a definition in the u.s when you give correct information but it makes people go against the government's um, policies and advice. So that's malinformation. Malinformation. Misinformation is is when you mistakenly put out information that's incorrect, and disinformation is when you put out incorrect information on purpose. Which is what the government do. <laughs> well, they do everything, don't they? Apart so from <laughs> government do disinformation. We do malinformation and misinformation. Um, but they call it misinformation. No, we, well, in this country, yeah. Right. But malinformation is the scariest thing because it's saying that the truth is not acceptable because it goes against what we're asking people to do. So you might, say, for example, have a, a public health... So it's, it's um, you know, if you've got a public health view, you basically want everybody to do a certain thing because it will achieve, you feel, the best outcome. Right. And then if people say, but on an individual basis, uh, for a certain group of people it's going to have a negative effect. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But that might put off a wider part of the population from having that public health benefit. Right. Yeah. So, for example, let's just say that we have evidence that um, people with a certain genetic background uh, aren't affected by cigarettes. Yeah? Right. So the government wants to have the policy of smoking is bad for everyone, tax it for everyone, and... And, and ban it or restrict it, yeah? Mm-hmm. You come out with information that says, actually, it's fine as long as you're like this and like that. And so the government would then decide and say, well, you're putting people off. So that your truth is putting people off the benefit of the public health message. That's really scary. It, yeah? it sounds made up. It does. I, it's we're 1984. Just, we're, we're talking it's in a room right world. now, but I, and it sounds like science fiction, but it's actually affecting the whole planet and the weirdest thing is it's it's just been drip fed in drip fed in not it's not weird it's understandable that it's come in that way because you wouldn't accept it if it was put the other way yeah yeah but it's drip fed in you know this the story about the frog in the in the water no. well th- there's a saying that if you put a frog in cold water and then heat the heat it up yeah the frog will die in the water but if you put it into hot water it'll jump out. Right. Yeah? So the idea is is that people will accept shit given to them if it's put in slowly, slowly, slowly from where they're comfortable with. Yeah. But actually the study is nonsense. The frogs jump out. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's what we need to be doing. It's a good we analogy, need to, though. We need to be, yeah, it is a great analogy for why people just accept a load of incremental creep on, on their freedoms. Yeah. We should be saying no. It's scary. I, I watched the, um, that podcast with... Um, who's the guy that got banned it was Joe Rogan podcast the guy got banned Robert Malone yeah and he was talking about um, I can't remember what the name of it now for some reason because we're talking about it but you know the way they're like poisoning our brains and everyone's like oh what was the term of it oh so annoying I can't remember but it was like yeah basically exactly what you're saying but um with information and they're just you know everybody yeah. I, I just can't like I can't I can't believe I just still can't get my head around the last two years I just I heard just, I heard a little presentation earlier today and they were going through all the news programs in the in the US that are sponsored by Pfizer and it's literally you know ABC News is brought to you tonight by Pfizer CNN yeah. is brought to you tonight by Pfizer during the pandemic I mean <laughs> what kind of world yeah. And, you know, we um, know, we know certainly as medics that the pharmaceutical companies have committed fraud. Well, they've got the biggest fines in history of Ab- the world, right? Absolutely. So, so why should we not expect them to be trying to game the data at this time? Why did the government let it happen? Well, governments want both the power and reputation of staying in power and the associated benefits that yeah. go with that. Yeah. And as far as the, I think they're concerned, having a vaccine to offer and having some data that said 95% of 
risk reduction, which was relative risk reduction, not absolute. That's a very important difference. We can talk about that. Yeah. Um, meant that, hey, look, we've got a winner. You know, we, we can get you out of this situation. They can be the knight in shining armor. So while you've, while you've got to have all these restrictions because COVID's so bad and that's not our fault, we're your savior. Do you so think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's great for the government to have, have a... And that's probably why, you know, the reliance on the... Well, I mean, the single focus on let's get a vaccine and let's depend on the vaccine and everyone has to have the vaccine. That's the w- w- one of the weirdest things. That's yeah. Bill Gates, though, isn't it? That's a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of people having a very narrow focus yeah. on how to stop a health crisis. But we, we, don't, we don't even look... so. When we have, uh, for example, with the COVID-19 vaccines, we don't didn't look at overall outcome. So, you know, what if you're if you're you know a citizen, you're worried about uh, getting COVID-19. You're worried about having a serious consequence from it and dying. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Principally, you'd want to know that the vaccine stops more people dying. But and spreading it to your grandma. Yeah. Right. But but the studies weren't set up to look at spread. They weren't set up to look at death. And they weren't set up to look at serious um, uh, adverse events. Uh, adverse events. So how did they get away of telling everyone it was effective? It, you it stopped transmission. So there's literally videos where they're like, it 100 percent stops transmission. So in, initially, it sh- it said a 95 percent reduction. Yeah. So that's from 0.88 percent down to 0.04 percent. Oh really? So that's a 95 percent. Re, um, relative reduction, yeah, but <laughs> so no only no, it's, <laughs> yeah. So that's and, and that's a te- oh God, that's a testing positive symptoms and testing positive, not being sick, not not being seriously sick, not being admitted to hospital, not dying. I think the there's a very good website called um, the NNT, which is the number needed to treat. So in medicine, we talk about the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm, because that's a better way to understand the benefits of medications, especially when you want to communicate it to people. So if you start trying to talk to, to patients and even to other professionals and doctors don't understand statistics and numbers themselves all that well, that's been, been proven in num- a number of ways. When you talk about percentages, people get muddled up. When you say... Yeah. If we do this to 100 people, one of them gets a benefit. Or we do this to five people, one of them gets a benefit. Yeah. So you need to give the vaccine to 119 people for one of them to, to have a benefit from it. And that benefit is this? It, it's variable, because in some of those people, there'll be, a larger, there'll be a larger benefit. But from that study, that was stopping people getting coronavirus. So once you've got in your brain that getting coronavirus is very dangerous then having a uh, not being able to get it is great yeah and 95 percent less likely but if you weren't likely to get it in the first place it's not a very big difference and if you weren't likely to be sick in the first place and then you find out that that's over a two-month period and once you start following up after that it doesn't make a difference yeah i, m- I remember watching it and people were like oh um why aren't you getting the vaccine i'm like well i'm healthy I'm the fittest I've ever been. Yeah. I'm the healthiest I've ever been. I ha- apparently I had COVID. I only mm-hmm. got a test like two Christmases ago because my best mate Steve was like, "Oh, we got COVID," and I saw him a few days before. And then I had a test and it said I had COVID, yep. and I didn't even know. It didn't Same even feel here. I had one mild fever. Yeah. And tested negative afterwards, but had antibodies a few weeks later. A few yeah. months later. I mean, I didn't feel anything, and I, I mean, like, so I I had it. And um, I, I was like, why would I, if it's 99.99, whatever it is, no one's gonna, I'm not going to die. Uh, and then they would be like, then the angle was, okay. But you needed well, to travel. <laughs> well, it, I mean, I was traveling anyway. I was just going to places yeah. where like, so it wasn't a problem. Um, and, you know, and then they were like, oh, well, you can spread it. And I was like, well, I don't believe for a second that this, this 
experimental jab that they've just come up with is going to do all this stuff they say so i was like i'll wait it out you know because i don't know I'm, I'm careful what i put in my body apart from biscuits i mean just like i'll go nuts on those <laughs> they, if they put vaccine in biscuits i'll be all over it i'd have had the like UK eight boosters would have totally literally done. straight digestive me and bruno just game on um that's what they should have done stick them in biscuits yeah. free biscuits yeah. right no I do not shouldn't say that because i'll start doing that. Wipe that wipe that yeah yeah, yeah. um but but I was like, I'm just gonna wait. Like I don't yeah, understand. Right. And but the problem was, they were like, if you have it, we'll all get to travel, we'll go back to normal. And I was like, okay, well, I'll believe that when I see it. Yeah, probably and, get to normal anyway. Yeah, yeah, and then I knew people getting it, and they were like, nearly crashed their cars driving home. And I was like, that's chaos. I don't like need to be no. tested because no. I was like, I'm not eighty, you no. know. And they would you see on the news that oh, it's a fourteen year old die from COVID. I was like. How do I know you're telling How you healthy truth? was that 14 yeah. year old? And um, you know, it was just all, it just seemed all dodgy to me. And then now I know people that have had the jab and I know people that have died from the jab. Mm-hmm. One of my clients died from the jab. And um, it was the saddest thing ever. I, I was trying to get hold of him because he had entered one of my events and his son called me back. And um, he was like, oh, yeah, my dad died. And like, we had a conversation because I knew the guy like a few years. Um, and he was like, yeah, he he had the jab, all healthy. And then four days later, he was hospitalized. And then he came out, recovered from that. And then they were saying about getting the second jab, had the second jab and then died. And they the, the and they said, he was cool. telling me that um, it's really sad actually think about it because I remember the conversation. Um, and he was like, they didn't put anything on the death certificate how he died because it was clearly the jab that did it Mm -hmm. and they were going through like a legal process now and i was like imagine all the other people that no one it's not an uncommon story right exactly and and so why isn't it you know i I also i've got a friend who's uh, i think it was his his dad or his uncle had the jab and 30 minutes later he went blind and he's never been able to see since like blind like he's in his 50s like, it, it, I just can't, like, when I, when I think about it, it, I don't obviously know all the stories, you know, obviously there was that Facebook group of like 200,000 people got banned because it was side effects. What the hell is going on? Like, how is this like, like, this makes me think that we're living in like crazy world. The, I mean, the, the number of complications with previous vaccines or, or medicines, when there were fairly low numbers, they were banned. Yeah, and why this didn't happen here? Is is it just that people felt well? We've well, not they felt that the government went. You know what? Are we going to get away with this? Yeah. Well, I always say life's like EastEnders. The truth always comes out. <laughs> always, it always comes out in a future episode. So there's no way but the they characters w- still remain right <laughs> most of them until they die don't they they literally die in these yeah. standards but the it. truth comes out but yeah. you still have the same players and that's the trouble is yeah we'll still have the same players but the truth will come out yeah the truth's going to come out but then what ultimately this is where it's scary is that what can we do about it we're a bit like helpless in a way really like what what so, can be done like so there are various things that n- need to be addressed and i think those of us who want the system to be different need to think about that yeah so we talked about finance earlier and financial education so currently many people are trapped in various ways be it debt or because they're working their ass off and not actually paying their bills or because the cost of living has gone up mm-hmm. so there's, there's the financial system and providing education and opportunities for people to understand those things is important then you've got soil and food so since the second world war um there was initially a shortage of food. The U.S. government put subsidies into corn, um, wheat, and sugar, mm-hmm. and that very much dr- drove the production uh, of those food substances, the fertilizer use, the you know the, the green revolution, and the demand to get as much out of the soil as you can. Uh, that led to all those products that are essentially processed, that are low in protein, that uh, have got then. Um, processed oils into them you've got soil that's damaged that uh, can't produce food that produces low quality food 
And to get over that, you've got to go back and you've got to do regenerative agriculture and you've got to sort of put the animals and the plants back together again and recreate the ecosystems. Which takes a decade, probably. No, it doesn't, actually. You, really? can, you can really bring soil back in a few years. It's quite incredible. Really? Once you put the right system together, n- nature's much... I mean, t- the soil is much higher tech than anything we've got, in, 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 you know, here. Yeah. yeah. We can understand how these things are put together. We can't understand. We don't yet fully understand how soil works. I mean, the amount of information... You know, there's more genetic material in a handful of soil than there is in the whole of you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so its ability to work together as a very complex system isn't isn't well understood because it's really high technology. So, but it, it will recover once it's it's given a break. Yeah. So we need to definitely go down that sort of direction. You've uh, you've then got the healthcare model, um, which has gone wrong over the last sort of eighty years. We've moved down the direction of. Um, um, the sort of mechanistic view of the body uh, that's taken us down to specialization, super specialization, which has its advantages, but means that most medics are focused on a fairly narrow area, at least the hospital specialists. Mm-hmm. Um, and the financial pressures on GPs t- to have very short periods of time with people. And alongside that, the disconnection between body and mind. Yeah. So that that because because the mind is a little too complicated to fit in the mechanistic model of the human being so let's push it to the side let's push out all the psychological sides uh, of health and just have a sort of physical body view of health um and for that you know we need to take a step back to create a sort of integrated health model that's what i'm trying to do i've started this online community uh, where people look at their health from a very broad perspective including a sort of what you might call a trauma-informed um, viewpoint, so understanding how your childhood has also influenced your unrecognised beliefs, because those are influencing your lifestyle choices that you're you're making today. Then we've got all the fabrications of the governments and pharmaceutical companies, all the narratives that are there to distract us. Um, uh, you know, what are the topics that people are always talking about, but actually you don't really see affecting people. Um, you know, go go down the the line of where's the money? Yeah, I mean, uh, f- for me, one of the biggest things is the sort of plant based um, food system. Yeah, so, you know, I, I ran a uh, breathlessness and fatigue clinic for eight years at my hospital, and I would say eighty percent of the patients were vegetarian or vegan, and that's very unrepresentative of society. Most people who are well, if you're on those diets it's considerably harder. You need to really manage your nutrient intake. Mm. And you're very commonly going to be on a low-protein diet, which is malnutrition. Mm -hmm. Loads of problems there. Where's the money? Where's the money in the meat versus plant-based argument? It's all in plant-based. So there are these stories that are designed to kind of also create conflict between between people in society, yeah? And that sort of division is being played on because that keeps people distracted from actually going back and looking at the actual the actual answers. Do you know, all this is just giving me a headache. Yeah. Like, there's just too much yeah. information. Like, all I want is a cup of tea and a biscuit and, like, watch a movie. Like, the uh, like the 90s. Like, you know, we had it crap music. I'm a Barbie yeah. girl, top of the pops. Kitty fiddlers, like, <laughs> you know, whatever it was back then. Like, but like ultimately, I just want to have a cup of tea and a biscuit, hang out with my dog and my missus yeah. and stuff. Like, like all this is just like too it's much heavy. of me. But COVID has brought that on very much because so. people are at home and they're like, you know, even when I was talk- explaining money to people, like what is money, and I was talking to Tommy Manor, and I, and I was like, if you asked a hundred people in the street, I said to him, I said, if we asked a hundred people in the street where does money come from I was like how many do you think would know and I was like I reckon 80 20 he was like 99 1 he would, was he would. thought only one person out of 100 would actually know mm. and I was like if that is even if it's 10 percent, that scares me if it's 10 yeah. 90 10 but he thinks it's 99 yeah. against one and it, I mean when it comes to health I've known more about health in probably the last 10 years because I'm more conscious I'm when I'm getting older obviously want to be stronger and fitter yeah. and 
when you're younger, you, you just go out and get shit faced, whatever. Who cares? Everything's easy. You know, yeah. no no one cares. You, you eat chips and mayonnaise because it's a quid back then <laughs> to survive, and you're like, I won't have to have breakfast, you know, whatever. But like now, it, it's there's so much information. It's it's like it's a bit mind blowing, and there's so and like you say, the government like they just lie about so much stuff, and I, it, it, I just my head's a bit spaced out. I think. There are, there are really good things that have come out of COVID. Yeah, I do think that. People, a lot of people have re-evaluated what they're doing in life. Another really good thing is a lot of people have woken up to the problems that are systemic in society. It doesn't seem like COVID was enough. Because if COVID was really bad enough, we would have already kicked out our politicians. We would have changed an awful lot of things in society. So the response, so even though people have become aware of what's going on. I don't think enough people in the society have become aware of what's going on and said, we now want a different system. Because the population does have the potential to change the system. Mm. You, know, you, you, you can't deny that the simple number of people who are not you know, creaming the system and manipulating it is vastly larger. Yeah? So we have to actually say we want something different we have to demand things to be different we have to say you know you cannot introduce certain policies unless they're in your manifesto and we as a population have voted you in for those things and that's what's going on at the moment you know all this sort of digital id stuff um and the and the the financial changes they want to bring in that was not in a manifesto we, we never said as a country we want these things there's no way they should be allowed to bring these things in until they've gone through an election process yeah, I mean, the thing is, the problem is, is central banks control everything. They control politicians. They control everything. It, I, 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 there's a guy called Richard Werner. He's an um, unbelievable economist. And uh, I follow everything he, he does. And he was saying about, there's, you know, he talks about how central banks create cultures. Like, all of our cultures are created from central banks. I don't know if you ever looked into yeah. this. But if you look at um, Japan, mm-hmm. right, what do you know Japan for? Lots of things. I lived there for a year. <laughs> but mostly? Like, what would you say is the one thing you kind of know them for? Well, the tech industry. Tech industry, right? But do you know why? Go on, no. But their central bank, right, back in the 70s, mm-hmm. around that time, the way, what they did is they only allocated money, um, loans and mm-hmm. stuff like that, for the, that industry and a couple of others. So no medical staff. You don't know Japan for like great medicine and, you know, mm. coming up from it. You only know them for um, technology, right? And their culture to us is technology, cameras, all this kind of stuff. And that's because central banks had a specific mm-hmm. way yeah. of lending yeah. money. So based on a central bank's control of money is what created cultures. Mm-hmm. And so when you think, when you look into this, and I'm fascinated by this stuff, you look at all cultures and you think, holy, okay, right? Because central banks create them. So what do they do in the UK? Well, in America, if you look, all the most innovation for medicine is American, right? Pretty much, yeah. Right. And that's because, why? They don't have NHS. They're financially yeah. incentivized by all of it, right? We don't really have much innovation here because there's not much reward for it. So ultimately, everything comes from money and the central banks control all the money. And so, I mean, what what's the UK culture? I don't know, the Queen? Like, what is it, really? And if you look at globalisation now, I mean, when I was Entrepreneurs. like... Entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's, I mean, there's so many, like, talking about side effects, it's like, well, they're saying that, you know, there's not as many serial killers now because entrepreneurs have stuff to do. <laughs> and if you, when you look into it, which I have, you actually think psychopaths have an outlet and it's being like an entrepreneur mm-hmm. or whatever it is, right? So there's not as many serial killers, you know, because psychopaths have online Shopify yeah. or, or whatever. <laughs> they can be obsessed about something and not go and kill everybody, yeah. right? So you think, and you think about like how it all works. It's like, it's, it's too much. Right? <coughs> you know, I just want a cup of tea and a biscuit. That's mm-hmm. all I bloody want. But you can't not get sucked into all this kind of stuff because I like to learn things, you know, so... Ultimately, central banks control everything, right? They want to do uh, CBDCs, all this kind of stuff. The only way out of this, right, and I think it might happen, is Bitcoin. That's the only way I can see us getting out of it. 
Because once the financial side changes, everything else will have to change because of it. Yeah, well, yeah. they have no power. If you and if us three only used Bitcoin to exchange value, mm -hmm. right? Well, we wouldn't need the pound or the dollar or whatever, and so we're not in that system. But I mean, I, I would. Would the government p have to pay me as a government employee in Bitcoin? No, I no. mean they so would, they wouldn't. They would only pay you in a. But the problem with so CBDC I'd still be controlled, is unfortunately. You mm. would still well, uh, but yeah. the thing is, you can exchange that money for Bitcoin like immediately. So you get paid on the first, however much you get. You turn it into Bitcoin immediately, right? And that's how it works. And how does that give me an advantage? In w in what way? Well, how if I turn my salary into Bitcoin, how yeah. does that help me? Well, um, okay. So if you compare central bank digital currency to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. Bitcoin, right? You can do whatever you want with it. No one can control it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Central bank digital currency. Say I was naughty or I sp sp spread malinformation mm -hmm. online and they went, right, don't let him spend any money within 300 yeah. meters of his house. Right. That's the difference. Yeah. They sure. could literally do that in the future where they don't let your card or your whatever. Oh, so you mean Bitcoin as alternative to financial control that we don't currently have, but which is coming. No, yeah, yeah. which yeah. is coming. It's, it's definitely yeah. going to happen. It's coming. They, they did it in, in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Richard Sinek froze everyone. Describes it. Yeah, I yeah. mean... They, programmable. These are, these programmable all, money, the, basically. Yeah. And in this, this country, it's like, how can that go on the news and we don't go, no way, Because no one, gets, no one understands money. And I'm sit, sat there, like, pulling my hair out, you know, thinking... You know, it's like Tesla cars, electric cars. They will be, if you say something on Twitter that doesn't, the government don't agree with, they can just go, well, you're only having two hours a day of your car now. We're going to turn it off. All right, this is the crazy shit you that can have happen. an electric car, don't you? Yeah, I don't have one either. <laughs> like, I absolutely would never have one. Like, it doesn't make sense to you for the environment either. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's, we, we won't even go oh, into that, dude. Like, we'll, but but, but a, C, a central bank digital currency compared to Bitcoin is freedom. Yeah, Bitcoin's freedom. There's no one. No one owns Bitcoin, you know, and so that is the hype. And I, so many younger people, you know, I, I say younger, I say under thirty, are like all over Bitcoin, Ethereum, all mm -hmm. these types of things, and they're ready for these. And countries are adopting Bitcoin. El Salvador, yeah. you know, um, all the like Central Africa. In the five years, there'll be like twenty countries, you know, because all these. I mean, I'm just on waffling here, but all these third world countries who are who are manipulated by America, they're like, oh, you haven't got this, right? Okay, well, we'll lend you 100 billion, right? Hook you up on a terrible interest rate you'll never pay back, but you have to let us own all your water, you know? And it, like Bitcoin won't be like that. Like El Salvador already borrowing against their Bitcoin, all this type of stuff. So they're independent of America. The, the, the president on Twitter is like, fuck you, in America. He's like, I don't care, you know, because he can. But back in the day, I mean, they couldn't. I, I, I'd love to believe it's going to work, but the idea for me is that, that it won't somehow be controlled, that there, is, there won't be some opportunity for, for governments to control they the can't. freedom it provides. They can't. There's no way they can control it. They can't. They won't bring in some kind of, it, you know, it's got to be regulated. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Well, they, I mean, they can, they can regulate it. But here's the, here's the thing. And, I, you know, I've mentioned this before to people. Is that if you're super smart and you're 18 now, mm -hmm. would you work for the government? Or would you go off and be an entrepreneur and, and make cool shit? Yeah, I'd do my own things. Right. Back in the day, they used to pluck people out of, of you know, be like, we'll give you 100 grand a year. Come and work for the government. It's really cool, yeah. with like the CIA. Like that just doesn't exist. It's yeah, like trying. Yeah. Imagine trying to sign someone up for war now. They'll be like, "No, nah, it's cool. I'm just going to watch Love Island. <laughs> I'm chilling. I don't need to get shot at. Like I'm fine." That's why they made the new Top Gun to, to yeah. help Navy recruitment. Though. Probably right, yeah, but you 500% know, five hundred percent increase in the year when Top Gun was first released in Navy recruitment. Back in the day, yeah, yeah, yeah. but that, yeah, even back then, it was like I want to, you know, you know, uh, uh, fly planes and stuff, you know, but. But now, good luck trying to get... You can't even get them to work, like, let alone, like, get shot at. So, mm -hmm. like, that's, I, that's all changing. They all know what Bitcoin is. They all know... They all see COVID and what's happened the last two years. Yeah. There's people that are 21 now yeah. that COVID was eight, when they were 18. Yeah, yeah. And so they've... Yeah. My, 15% my of their amazing years of their life been robbed 
right, by the government. Oh, they managed to carry on pretty well. They, yeah, they didn't follow too many of the rules. But but they think it's a travel one, you know. It, yeah, it, yeah, it was like different. It was different. Completely yeah. different. So th- they know they've been robbed. They're, get, they're asking questions why. They're seeing all the data that's going to come out mm. and more will come out mm. f- thanks to people like you. And, and they'll be like, nah, Bitcoin's good. I'll just stick to Bitcoin. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. It, and people are getting paid in Bitcoin now. It's all, it's all, it's all happening in the background. Um, I mean, compared to when I was got involved in it five, six years ago, to like how it is now, like it's mind blowing. We went to El Salvador mm-hmm. and we went to Bitcoin City there. Yeah, and uh, it was like, you know, everyone in that country's got a Chivo wallet. It, it, it's it's all happening. So I have hope. Like the last couple of years, where you you know look at how the government control everybody, and Bitcoin is the one thing that. They don't. they don't control and it's money money everything's controlled by central banks money yeah. I, I can't see there's no way they're gonna there's no way they're gonna get around it it's it's gonna happen and if it does it will change everything it will absolutely change everything presumably though if they they, they could say for example if you don't keep enough of your income on a central bank uh, currency system which will allow you access to X, Y, and Z within society, then you are not participating or whatever, and therefore you're going to be subject to controls. Like what? Put everyone in jail? Well, you can't. You're in jail, but they'll stop, stop your car from working or other things like that, or your yeah. travel. Who you knows? Know, like, look how much travel got stopped so yeah. easily now. I mean, but ultimately, if that type of thing happened, like young people. I don't think they care that much about living here. I don't... In I, the UK? Yeah, yeah no. I, d- I just don't no. think it's as, as attractive as it used to be. You know, it's like, it's, you don't need... You can work from your laptop now. You don't need to have a nine-to-five, all this type of stuff. Yeah, that's you a don't, huge shift. You don't need to live in London. You don't need to do all these things. You don't need to go to university unless you've got specific sort of like... So I think, like, young people in the future will w- be way more nomadic. They'll they'll travel the world and I just think it'll be way more common. It's just, if I look at it, I was traveling when I was sort of 25, 15 years ago mm. and I, I was like a, I was like a bohemian, like, yeah, like, where's he gone? Oh, he's, yeah. he's in like Fiji surfing. But what? Like, and now it's like totally normal. But you're like, going to become a parent sooner or later, right? Sooner or later, probably. And, um, you're <laughs> going to, that, that's going to change. The, it's going to change your life. Well, you say that I'm building a house in Costa Rica right now. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, my plan is to have places everywhere in case. Most people, when they've got kids, are not going to be as mobile Mo- as before they had kids. But then the next generation will, because they're all financially independent. They're all they're, n- they're all working from their no. laptops. No. I think in 20 no. years, your kids will not like the moving, and they'll tell you. You don't think? Kids do not like... No, they love the repetition. That's why they want the same story read every night. They yeah, don't but, want to sleep in a different bed But each when night. they're 21, though... Oh, yeah. When, but what, so when they're 21 to... Yeah. They've had children, they'll be mobile. Yeah. More yeah, mobile yeah. than before. But yeah. once they go back, once they start having children again, people are going to still have children. Yeah. And that's also when they start to hold jobs and have more financial... Um, stability. Stability, or not yeah. so stability, but... They're, they're more financially linked to the society. Yeah. yeah, they're going to be more stable again. Yeah, I, well, I think governments are going to have to adopt Bitcoin. I, look at El Salvador and these other countries. They're, I mean, third world countries will do it quicker mm-hmm. because they don't want to be ripped off by everybody. I mean, look at what happened with Greece. I mean, we won't go into all that stuff. Yeah. But you know, EU is, is a failed idea, I think, um, and so. I, I just I do have hope. I do yeah. have hope. But there's hundreds of millions of people in Europe who still think the EU is one more success, and they can't understand why we left. Do they though? Until they don't. Yeah, most of the people I know still don't understand why we left. Okay, but say so. Say the thing is, like opinion on EU ten years ago, that would have been two hundred million, right? Yeah. So now it's a hundred. So it's half. No, no, no. I think the a lot of people were voicing concerns about it. Um, you know, the Dutch uh, population voted against uh, further integration. Uh, that was the Maastricht Treaty, wasn't it? And um, then the government said, "Oh, you, you know, you haven't really thought about this. Let's run the referendum again." 
Yeah. So yeah, it was a vote against it, and then they went back and had another referendum. You are kidding me? No, they had two referendums yeah. in Denmark. No, not Denmark. Ho- um, Holland. Holland. Yeah, the Netherlands. Yeah. What? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's it's Holland. Yeah, but there was. Uh, I'm not, not sure the exact story there, but there was a country where the population basically voted against another another move into the EU integration, and then the government didn't follow that through and didn't say it was binding, and then they went and, and, and went either against it or I think they then had another referendum. So the the governments in Europe have basically... I mean, if you look at lots of surveys, lots of parts of the population haven't wanted in different countries to be part of the EU, but their governments have wanted to be part of the EU because they've, they've seen the benefits. Yeah. Or they're corrupt. Yeah. <laughs> they're benefits for, th- for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so We're laughing, but that's really messed so, up. So, you know, now we are where we are. And uh, I don't think that that many people in the EU uh, want out uh, within within those countries. I think that a lot of people got used to it and think, oh, if we have, aren't part of that now you know, we'll lose some of the benefits they've been told they've got for a long time. Okay, Eastern European countries, there's some differences there. They want out. A lot more of the people there. I mean, that's a great thing about, you know, the uh, Eastern European countries, their ability to challenge and say, hey, wait a minute, this looks pretty ridiculous. It's much easier for people from those cultures to do it, whereas in England, it's like, oh, we better not say that. But that's the thing. I think people aren't scared of saying things now. Like you, you're uh, you're literally one of the top ten examples in the last five years. You've got to be interesting. <laughs> you, you, probably, you probably don't want to know, like think or say that. But like, I, I think I genuinely think you're the reason that mandates were stopped. I think I'll leave that as your opinion. <laughs> yeah. What's that thing that Stephen Crow- Stephen Crowder? Where he's like. He's like, and he's like, tell me where I'm wrong or something. Oh, he does. Yeah. It's like, I'm like, you're the number one reason. Um, what's it? Well, he's like, he's like arguing me or something. Yeah. That's tell me I'm wrong or something. Wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, like, hundred percent. Like, if you wouldn't have done that video, we might still be under some kind of like crazy lockdown. We might have gone forwards to. Well, we might have had. You know, I'll say it from. There were a lot of other people working against the vaccine mandates in particular against the nhs mandates there was nhs 100k and there was a uh, together declaration lots of other people and i just became a well-known figure on that scene poster boy <laughs> poster boy change yeah. my mind it's called yeah. <laughs> um uh but if if myself and others hadn't done what we did at that time then we might have gone through it seems crazy to imagine it but with the nhs vaccine mandate and lost 100,000, 80,000 members of staff from the NHS. Yeah. We might then have also gone through with vaccine passports. And, you know, the e- EU is there saying, oh, we've got the tech for, you know, from the COVID passports. We can just, you know, translate that into, and everyone. How convenient. Like, I mean, it's like you said at the beginning of this, this conversation, the lines they're coming out with are just so glaringly obvious. I, I, I do wonder why... It, it, you know, it, it's like a badly filmed show sometimes. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah. And you just, it's like, what again? It's just cheese they're coming out with. And why we are, why more people aren't saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, as I said, the science isn't good enough. I mean, you know, I had to be, I, I tried to be reasonably diplomatic. So, you know, doctors have got a choice. Yeah. yeah. Either they can, either they, they, they're not concerned. Or they're going to shut up because they're scared about the reputational damage that, that they can experience if they ask questions about what's been going on with COVID. Or they do what I do, which is to try and walk a reasonably fine line of not being completely against everything and and more asking the questions and putting the the emphasis onto people I think should have the answers and don't have the answers. Um, so yesterday I put out a little post that said, because I get a lot of people asking me, should, you know, uh, I'm I pregnant, you know, should I, you know, should I have a vaccine or not? Yeah, and of course I'm not going to give out information to people uh, over social media who I don't know the, the conditions for. Yeah. But they should be going to their GP or whoever it is and saying, what are the risks of someone like me having it or not having it? You know, what's in the vaccine? Yeah. You know, how many people go on to have side effects? Your GP doesn't know the answer. Of course they don't know the answer. But that's the point. 
It's scary, isn't first, it? Well, first, do no harm. So do no harm to yourself or to your, your child. Yeah? yeah. And then when you think there's a possibility of a benefit, find out. Yeah. And if you want to follow, not to think about it and follow the government's advice on that, on, on the vaccine schedule now, then, then okay. But if you, if you first don't want to do any harm, you first have to then check the quality of the evidence and see if you're satisfied. We don't have that evidence. So you're not right. going to get the benefit, but you're not going to get the potential harm. So you can choose. What are the side effects of the jab? Well, firstly, I think that the um, we we don't know the percentages. We don't know the the numbers of people who have a problem from from the jabs, and that's the biggest problem is is not knowing it and not quantifying it. So we've got you know, recognisable problems like the central vein thrombosis in people's heads that occurred with the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. We had people who died at my hospital from that. What, so what happened? You get a clot in your brain and the blood flow can't go through it. So they, people intensive care doctors they, in London yeah. know that people have died on their intensive care units from side effects of, uh, of COVID-19 vaccines. And people, yeah. at the fir- first of all, they didn't, know that they were and, and we just you know doctors simply didn't know what was going on so right. people asked and they said this and then you know someone another expert came in what do you think could it be and initially it was like no we don't think it has been and then suddenly they found out that it was happening in other places and they just had the vaccine and then of course everyone had to start saying well actually it was the vaccine so why aren't the news reporting this well Uh, I mean, I, I see it. You just said the answer without saying it. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I gave the answer that my nursing colleagues gave when they were asked the question from um, Nothing. Yeah, they just <laughs> it's stood like, there. Like, it's just too. At each other, like, it's too difficult to get your head around it to, to to come out with an answer. How is it fair that we live in that world? Like, let's be, like let's be honest. Like, imagine you, like your fair. house. Yeah, uh, exactly. Imagine you had that. You, you you're the who head of your you house. Get, who told you it was going to be fair? Like. It should be fair, right? Why? Everything should be fair. Why? It'd be nice, but why? Because that's how the world should be. But that would mean everyone had to be delivering fairness all the time. I and mean, we, we tried to work towards fair. Fair is fair is nice, but but why does it have to be fair? Well, why why shouldn't why? it be fair? Because society and human beings aren't by nature all equivalent in the way they treat each other. Yeah, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't be. No, it doesn't mean it should be. Why, why should we expect... But the rules should be fair, is what I mean. I'm not talking about the, like the, how you cheat people. Yeah, the rules should be fair, indeed. The ru- everything, yeah, the rules should be fair. Yeah. And but once, once you've got the opportunity to win favour from bias, which people have got in loads of areas of society, yeah, yeah then you're so, going to do that. But the rules should be that they can't do that, right? And so if that was the rule, they can't do that, then they'd get in trouble for it. But it seems you like think so. Yeah. It, well, that's best <laughs> Unless case. You got friends. <laughs> but but yeah, but that's obviously, and that's transparency is everything. There are there hasn't been transparency for for hundred years. Yeah. But, but now transparency is in the internet, and it's all coming out, and you know, next generation is seeing all this. Yeah. That's when, it's all going to change. I think. I think. I mean, to the best it can, anyway. Yeah, I, uh, I think there's potential for that change but I think the the, the system is is so ingrained I, I, I don't see us moving off the standard medical model of treating the symptoms of trying to manage disease rather than investing money up front in, in people being healthy in the first place are you saying I mean, I'm too optimistic is yeah, that what you're saying I'm saying you, you're, <laughs> an, you're, you're a ridiculous depressing optimist. conversation <laughs> I'm like just get yeah. Bitcoin everyone I mean, you, you, right. you're saying you want you know you want your biscuit and your cup of tea John yeah. yeah but when you see your child going off and experiencing something else in life and being caught by the impact of society or seeing what's going on for them, yeah. you'll, you'll get concerned in a different way and you'll put your cup of tea and your biscuit aside and say... I mean, I do that already with... Like, I know you're not just after cup of tea and biscuit. Yeah, though. I mean, yeah, I, I, I am already very like sensitive to that and I do talk about things like that and hopefully it has helped some people. I mean, from the messages I get, it has. But, yeah. um, you know... It, 
it, yeah, I think when I have kids and stuff, it will make me look at things differently. I've already thought about homeschooling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, it, it, and I, I know that the rates of that is like 100,000 times more than it used to be 10 years ago in America. But, it, 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 I mean, what we could go on about what they teach kids in school, which I don't know about. I only see, you know, what I see. Um, not just Ricky Gervais, which is a legend, but uh, he, like, he's a legend. Watch his special. It's unreal. Yeah. Uh, but, I, yeah, of course. And, I, you know, what... It, it comes down to how many minutes you've got in a day. It, like, you, like you said, you've been flung into this whirlwind of what's gone on the last six months. And before we were talking, you're like, sometimes I don't know if I should have said something. Obviously, you should for humans, yeah. you know. But um, like you say, is it worth all the stress? And that, like, hopefully it should be. But, well, it shouldn't be stress, ultimately, well, should it? It should just be. There's a lot of there's a lot of stress. Stress is a really huge thing. But I think I feel like I spent the last twenty years or so working with my own mental system, should we say? Yeah. yeah. So you know, I've sat on a cushion most days meditating. Yeah. And have learnt. Well, one of the things I learnt was how to be calm and how not to kind of, you know, blow my top and other things like that. That's but that's not necessarily. On, on its own a very useful thing because you've got to be able to express and confront the issues which is something I haven't historically done so you know if, I, if you're a medic you tended to conform yeah. yeah you had to do otherwise you wouldn't get to be as a consultant in the hospital yeah, yeah? so we're so uh, w- in society I, I'm a conformist within the healthcare system I'm a rebel yeah yeah um, so for me there were internal changes going on where I was looking at the how I'd um, done things to please others how I'd you know orientated myself not towards what I needed in life yeah. but others and I think those those shifts and those changes internally thou had to come out in a different way and so suddenly there was this opportunity presented and it was like well if I'm going to be me I've got to do this so I did it did you have a chat to him after that? Yeah, a little bit, just in the corridor. Uh, He went off to another room and there was some, we didn't know what what was going on. And I was there with the CEO and various other people from my hospital who were kind of, I think, you know. um, Well done. (laughs) Well, someone did say that, actually. Someone senior did say that. Uh, I said, well done for getting that in. Um, And they'd expected I would say something, um, but didn't think I would say what I did say. The, the the mad thing about it is actually if you watch the video all you did is drop a tiny bit of conversation into it into the whole pandemic and it changed it all and that goes to show how controlled everything is because there was no common sense before that yeah. you, you literally you didn't even say that much you're like no. look dude for me, it doesn't it. make sense. That's all I said is, you know, yeah. I've got antibodies. I'm basically only working with patients with COVID at that time. Yeah. <laughs> and if you give me the vaccine, you don't even know how much protection it's going to give me for a short period of time. And you're going to keep vaccinating me every month or two Until to keep die. the levels up? Until no, of course not. Yeah. Why are you going to get rid of the whole staffing population? It doesn't make any sense. Randomly, like n- not long after that happened... A couple of months, I was at a petrol station, like an M&S, getting a bit of food, and there's two paramedics in there. And I was talking to one of them, and I was like, oh, you know, how's COVID, whatever. And he was like, oh, yeah, don't really, don't ever see him anymore. And I was like, oh, really? He goes, yeah. And I was like, why are you so busy then? And he goes, well, everyone's off. He's, he's like, no, everyone's getting a test, and they're getting, they're, they're saying they've got COVID. So you get like a week, two weeks off work. So he's, and he was like, we've got 80% people off so he goes that's why we're busy because we've got no staff because mm. everyone doesn't want to work anyway i mean some people got covid an awful lot of times didn't they right yeah and it's, <laughs> it's like, so, so it was like it couldn't and they were like, vaccinated and it, yeah and they wore their mask all the time but yeah i mean when you look back at how it was up, handled right? when you look back at how it was handled could it have been handled worse oh for sure <laughs> how? Sure. How could they have handled handled it worse? Like, I just can't. I can't think of a way. Canada, China. Oh, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> yeah, Canada. 
China, I, I mean, the, never really know the, the you know, the implication about how bad and uh, terrible uh, unvaccinated people were in this country was, was fairly subtle compared with some places. I mean, o- Austria was basically mandating the, vi- the vaccine for the entire country. I saw yeah. that. I mean, I'm, my, some of my kids um, live in Germany and they've been still up until only a few, until very recently, having COVID tests three times a week at school. What? Yeah. And if someone in their year group's sick, they get it every day. Unbelievable. And that mm. the kids don't get it. Well, they don't I get mean sick from it. Healthy kids don't get sick from COVID, no. Yeah. And, you know... We locked up healthy people. Wh- why... Years. If you if you if you as a parent know someone who's got a child who got seriously sick from COVID, you'd be more concerned about COVID. Yeah. You would probably also know that, that child wasn't a healthy child almost certainly before they got seriously sick with COVID. Yeah. So you'd probably say, you know what, I know, know that that's the same. That child's really unhealthy in the first place. My child's not. So why would you do it? You'd only do it if you actually believe there's some advantage for you and your family. Yeah. And basically, people have been told safe and effective, which the government never knew, but has peddled. And then you've got, can you travel and can you do X, Y, and Z? And is there some kind of social pressure to do it? And in many cases, that's yes. And, and the, now the idea that it's on the vaccine schedule Mind blowing. What ha, what do you think of them vaccinating kids? For COVID? Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. I think it it's ridiculous. I really do think it's ridiculous. I think that, you know, we've been, it, it, it's the idea. I mean, I mean, there's the vaccinate children um, because they've got a sick, uh, um, a vulnerable person in their household. I, I can see why they put some emphasis towards that. But that child is going to get COVID sooner or later. It's not going to be foolproof. And hey, it, it, that child's got another 80 years and we have no data, no long-term data on the potential side effects. And it doesn't and stop works. transmission anyway. It doesn't stop it, no. It redu- but people, people are swayed by reductions rather than absolutes. Uh. Yeah. But, you know, there are so many more important things to do to be healthy than take that vaccine. And for me, that was always the, oh, the the, the gut wrenching point about it yeah. is that, you know, when Boris first went in to Tommy's with COVID, yeah, yeah, and came out and started to talk about uh, obesity and how that was a problem, and yeah, I thought, oh my God, maybe they're going to do something decent here. I mean, for, for me, we should have been okay, not mandating but recommending healthy. A healthy lifestyle. It was such an opportunity. We could have changed the the health of the country for the better. You know, I would have immediately created outdoor gyms. You know, some kind of covered space in every single park. Invested money in those things. Yeah. Outdoor exercise classes to keep everyone, you know, busy and doing something. Subsidized the you know all the sort of natural health approaches. I, I, okay, maybe. The, not everything, but that direction, yeah? yeah? The recommendation should have been you should go out and exercise three times a day. Yeah. Not you're only allowed to go out once a day. You should have been told to go out three times a day. Yeah, I had to close my gyms, and I couldn't yeah. get my head around it. It's the healthiest place Yeah, you yeah. could. And event, if you look at El Salvador, they, they recommend, their commercials recommend yeah. go out and be, yeah. go on walks and be healthy. Yeah. Like, don't worry about vaccination and stuff. Just go be healthy. Yeah. I mean, I might be a bit of a funny one, but... You know, for me, I understand that I should be exposed to, to germs in order to be healthy. Yeah? yeah. And, you know, when I go to a gym and I see people wipe everything down with some nasty chemical that I don't want anywhere near my body, yeah. I'm like thinking, would you mind just leaving your own sweat there? I'd, I'd actually rather touch that than these chemicals because yeah. they shouldn't be touched by your hands in general. Yeah. If you, I mean, if I watch my dog, it rolls around in fox shit. Lovely. There must be a natural happy, reason it does. Does your dog look happy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's like on yeah, it. Yeah. And she rolls around in yeah. like you know all sorts of. There there's, must be the, a. There's one thing I want to say, say and that's that. Historically, with the pandemic, the, the the young, the healthy, get the virus, 
and that provides protection. Right. And for me, that's always what I was going to do. I could see the vaccine being introduced. I could see the problems. I could see it was affecting the vulnerable. I felt I'm I'm happy enough to move myself to the front line, take care of these people, yeah. and I won't need to take the vaccine. I'll get the virus. I'm not going to end up in intensive care like these people here because I'm healthy. And then that was turned around into you're somehow a misfit and a, and a renegade because you don't want to have the vaccine. And we're going to find you're you killing people. Yeah, you're a murderer. Yeah, you're a murderer. Inconsiderate. Yeah, unreal, isn't it? Yeah, but quite. Interesting. I mean, I know that it's more difficult for people to come forwards and tell you they don't like what you've done than it is to come forwards and tell you they do like what they've done, what yeah. you've done, yeah. But the families who identified me as, wait a minute, aren't you that doctor from the TV? They were all happy about what I'd done yeah. and were, you know, were, were pleased about that. Yeah. And the feedback I had from, from people, I mean, I had potential, I think I had two or three genuinely, no, I had one questionable one, which was like, are you sure what you're doing was, was right? Uh, there was criticism, you know, in circles, but not actually people brave enough to feed towards me. I was a little bit su surprised that some colleagues will have a public discussion about my behaviour who've got my phone number and didn't call me and say something. I think that's pretty weak. Um <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not an unreasonable person. It's not like I was going to ball them out, was it? No, no. you're no. the most common sense man in England, <laughs> or UK, or the globe at one point. Yeah, like, so, you know, they, they know me. If they've got my phone number, they've spoken to me enough times, they know that they can come and say, hey, Steve, something or other, look, I'm going to put out this comment and say something. I don't agree with what you've done. Okay. Maybe they've got cash for it, though. Not, not enough to, to stop them doing that. I mean, they could have still spoken to me about it you never know do you yeah it's a bit weird isn't it yeah do you, what do people say to you now when you're at work do they say anything no or is it much. gone no. it's all over mm, pretty much I mean the odd the odd trainee suddenly goes ah you're the Steve James or you're the Dr. Steve James like, yeah okay yeah and then you know by, by then you know, I'm, I'm not making something out of it and, and neither are they usually so it's yeah. fine yeah that's cool isn't it yeah but, you know, it's, it's sort of nice because, you know, uh, this uh, well, the 1st of June, NHS uh, England released a letter saying that you're not going to need to wear masks in hospitals yeah. um, unless you're dealing with uh, particularly vulnerable people from sort of hematological or cancer groups. Yeah? yeah. So once I'd seen that, I was then, OK, I'm not wearing a mask in the hospital. And I was still questioned about it a couple of times. And I said, you know, you know that I'm not someone who's going to follow the rules and do what I'm told to do. But yeah. this time I am actually following following the rules and just the rest of the trust is a bit late yeah, and yeah. catching up with the guidance. Yeah. So it's a, it, it, what I like is it, you know, okay, it, it, if I'm now known as a bit of a, uh, of a non-conformist and will, we'll, you know, challenge things a bit, that's okay because I'm that, comfortable with doing that now. The, the fact that you say that, I think it's weird because you're just someone that has common sense. Like to have someone who's got common sense and call them a non-conformist. Like we can't be live. That's not fair. We can't be living in a world like that. We are. We we definitely are. And um, you know we 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 don't. You know, look at look at the woke culture and political correctness. Yeah, we've had that. In our in our society, growing and growing for you know a good couple of decades, yeah. Uh, what was this example I saw recently on the U.S. Uh, a high school in the U.S. A, a child has been a 13 year old had a letter sent home, a telephone call from the principal to say that he had sexually assaulted another another pupil at the school because they'd used the wrong pronouns. You you can't believe it. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And this is a, a dis essentially, I think, a, a, a distraction story. It's a f fabricated. Of course. You know, the, the, not not that story, but the whole gender discussion issue. It does not affect the vast majority of the population. I don't mind respecting anybody for, for what they want to do. No problem. Mm. But it doesn't mean that... Um, you know, offence happens from that person's point of view. It's not from the intention. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ricky Gervais is 
It's, uh, it's great, the special one. That was it, like, it was just brilliant. The way he talks about guitar lessons. Oh, I haven't seen that bit. I saw the bit about um, uh, old-fashioned women with wombs. Yeah, with yeah. vaginas. With vaginas, yeah. so old-fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the ones that have got dicks. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's just it's like, great. I mean, it's common sense. Yeah, it's common sense. How is that comedy? And he was saying about, like, how, if you were to write a tweet 10 years ago that's <laughs> saying that a woman yeah. doesn't have a dick, and then you get like, he's like, no one saw that coming. No, yeah. no. <laughs> But the, the best one is where he's like talking about Twitter and the guitar lessons. Mm. You gotta watch it. I won't say okay. it, so I don't want to do it injustice, you know. Um, but yeah, no, it's. I mean, that whole that it's all we're all sucked into all of it. Uh, do you know Calvin Robinson? A little bit, yeah. So I did a podcast with Calvin Robinson, and he talks about all that kind of stuff. And I was like, look, I said, I think the problem is that you keep talking about it. I said, I was like, when was the last time you walked outside? some transgender person like kicked off for you about pronouns I was like it's never happened no. it doesn't happen it's just no. on TV and yeah. it, like the more you talk about it the more it feels real to people it's a bit like COVID if you didn't talk so about it why on TV, is it filling so many column inches no, no one would have known about COVID if you wouldn't have talked about it on the news like no one would have mm, like we, we would have no. gone oh there's something going on but no, really no, no. It no, wouldn't you couldn't have, have gone to hospital because we didn't have space for people we didn't have enough oxygen we had to, you know, create new oxygen condensers and reroute the supply so that we could have enough oxygen to keep everybody who had COVID alive. Yeah. You know, that was quite big. That was, that was, yeah. you know, really something happening at the hospital. But you weren't overwhelmed though, were you? We managed to move things. And but I mean, I also worked for the, the transfer service yeah. uh, in, in the second wave and we were shifting hundreds of patients around the southeast of England intensive care units because they didn't have space in each hospital so you'd have to move them from this one to that one really? yeah crazy isn't it? yeah hundreds of patients moved because their hospital didn't have enough space for them my mum got COVID actually mm -hmm. and she was hospitalised mm -hmm. um, because they came round and her oxygen was on I don't know I can't remember what number but it was like yeah. two below Okay. and then the next day it was like one over and then they took her in the hospital um my mum's 75, northerner, she, you know, nothing, you can't kill the woman. Like, even, she'd have had triple COVID, still got through it, no problem. But she got to hospital, and um, four hours later, she's, like, ringing me, you know. And so she went on the oxygen ventilator thing, whatever it was, and then she was right as rain, right mm -hmm. after. But the thing, the weird thing was is that she, they'd gone round to see her the day before, and she was obviously really bad, but there was no process. It was, like, all... Give us a call when you're really fucked. You're a bit Terror. fucked this is, this was This was a, when a, a real crime, another crime. It yeah. was this stay at home until you absolutely cannot manage. Yeah. And so patients turned up with the lowest oxygen levels I've ever seen in my life. I yeah. don't know if any colleagues have ever seen it lower before. It was slightly strange because people were looking relatively well. But yeah. when you look at their oxygen levels, it was like, this is, you know, we'd never let anyone get to these levels. And they, just stayed, they were just at home. And we didn't look for any kind of early intervention treatments, uh, what treatments we could have done for the population at home, because it was all like, just stay at home and leave it. And then when you come in, you know, the, when, you, when you put these studies on and you try and uh, evaluate some of these early intervention treatments in patients who've already got the, such an established disease process, you're too late. Yeah, you need to be trying it in in people who've only just got COVID and are starting to get unwell, not five days down the line. Yeah. and oxygen levels in their boots and about to go on a ventilator. That's what Doctor Peter McCullough says, isn't it? It talk about ivermectin when now they're saying it's great, but at the time they were like, "Oh, horse tranquilizer, like people yeah. are crazy, yeah. conspiracy theories." Yeah. Like looking back, that could have saved. Well, he talks about numbers could have saved eighty percent of yeah. the deaths. So I mean, I was we had a family. Uh, who asked for ivermectin for their family member yeah. um, as an intensive care patient. So I went out, this was quite early, um, reasonably early on, I went out and sort of reviewed all the data on it. And, you know, it's difficult to review the studies that haven't, so some have been re retracted, were they retracted because there was a mistake in the study or because someone didn't want that study to be out there. Yeah. Um, and the, the actual evidence that you could look at showed there was no benefit in the population of people who were, already on a ventilator and are already extremely yeah, sick yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um but you know I, I went through that process because i wanted to to see what the data was there yeah. but you know it was the kind of that family they want ivermectin yeah that, like, that's going to save them but you know 
uh, critical care doctors have been through I mean I, I'm only new to that so I haven't seen it as well as, yeah. as, as many of my colleagues have um, there's always been that story of oh this drug is going to save everyone yeah and then because, and then there's, oh, there's a study that shows that it has a, a fantastic benefit and then they try, you try and use it and it doesn't make a difference and you, you then repeat the studies and it turns out it wasn't true so people have got a bit yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that yeah. one's going to make a real difference. Yeah, people were laughing at the beginning. Yeah, steroids. They'll try steroids again. It turned out actually steroids helped. Yeah, really? but but people were sort of chuckling away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And bloody, st- you know, that's not going to work, is it? Because we know it doesn't work because we've tried it in hundreds of diseases, and it doesn't really make much difference in a lot of lot of a lot of problems. Yeah, it can, can have its benefits, but the, the thing is, is that once you've got a disease process well established. In a hugely complex human physiological system, yeah. the idea that one drug is going to make a significant difference it, it is really a bit ridiculous. Yeah, um, and so it was true there. Yeah, for some of them, yes. Yeah. But but the fact that you know the ability to influence such a large system is quite difficult, and so the reason why so many studies don't work in patients who are really really ill already yeah. is because the chance of those drugs actually affecting such a large complex system is quite quite low. Yeah, you need studies for horse, 20 years. Yeah, yeah and the yeah. horse is out of... Yeah, but, but the system is so set into that process that the idea that a drug at that stage is going to make a difference, in, in general, it's going to be hard to find silver bullets that will make such a difference. If you were, like, with everything you know now, if you were to, like, advise the next generation of people mm-hmm. what to do when it comes to health... What would you say the top three things are? The first thing is is take an ancestral view on health. Yeah, so uh, work out. So our, our biology developed over hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Yeah, to allow us to be optimally healthy. Yeah, um, but living in a hunter gatherer society, so sort of pre civilization. So what did people do then? So they they lived a life of contrasts. Yeah, so they lived. Uh, in light and dark, they experienced hot and cold. They were fasted and fed. They did strong movements and had soft touch. They had solitude and they had community. Um, what else can we go on? Um, they walked slow. They ran fast. Um, they had all these contrasts, and our biology responds to these contrasts. So, you know, when your guys are in the gym and they're and they're essentially ripping muscle fibers by by lifting uh, incremental uh, load yeah that their body is responding to that and saying there's some activity going on down here there's a message coming from the muscles to the brain that says oh I'm, i need to stay alive because i must be doing some work so it makes you brighter mentally but then the body also responds back and says let's build more muscle so you know we respond to stresses, yeah. So hermetic stress. So we're pushing our system in a certain direction. So if you always experience the cold, and you just want to wrap up and stay nice and warm, your body gets less and less capable of dealing with cold. So when you expose it to the cold, you increase its ability to handle the cold. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So what did um, what did our ancestors do? How did they live? Yeah. What would they have chosen to eat? They wouldn't have chosen to eat most of the food that's in the supermarket. Yeah, they would have chosen to have eaten. What would you eat if you're a get back? You're an ancestor. Pigs. Pigs. Okay. So yeah, and you're going to take what out of the pig? Ideally, you're going to take something that's a fairly high protein, but it's also got enough fat in it because there are two things your body needs primarily, and that's essential fats and essential amino acids. It doesn't need carbohydrates. Carbs are great if you want to grow. You're a child. If you want to grow because you're you're pregnant, uh, or if you want to grow because you want to get fatter, um, most people don't want to be in the third group, but are, are using it that way. Or if you're exercising and you're just going to burn off the calories, but if you're not doing that, you're going to tend to run into a problem. And most of the foods, the foods we have now with this, you know, the food pyramid and these sort of, you know, the the right kind of plate to eat, it's not based on any science. And since we've moved towards those models, the rates of obesity and disease have gone up enormously. So, you know, you need to find a way to to be in nature. Yeah. So you need to see things not only close up with human beings, but you need to see distance. You need to see horizons. You need to be uh, ideally having blue therapy and green therapy. So seeing the sea or rivers or water spaces and, and nature. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you need to learn how to sleep properly. Not learn how to sleep. You knew how to sleep as a child. As a teenager, your process will change. You'll go to bed later. You'll wake up later. But you needed that time. Um, so sleep. Yeah, there's, there's almost nothing you can do that's better for your body than those last hour or two of sleep. So never shorten your sleep. I did it for 20 years. It was a disaster. <laughs> Trying to get by on five or six hours. Yeah. Um, don't. Yeah. Respect your sleep. Eat like your ancestors. So I would say an animal-based, uh, high-protein, high-fat diet as the primary focus for, for your for your food. And then you'll take the biscuits on top, which is fine. Yeah, so you'll be all right. Um. Uh, Can I just yeah. say, this is why your class is a non-conformist. Because mm. I've just asked a doctor, mm. right, how, what's the best thing to do? And you said, diet and be healthy and exercise. And if you go to America, they're like, have this pill, take that pill, yeah. have that pill on top of that pill. I know Americans that walk around with bags of pills. Yeah. And this is, this is what doctors should do. They should literally say what you just said. I'd like people to employ me when they pay me when I'm when they're healthy. The old Chinese doctor system, yeah. That you, if you were sick as a patient, you didn't pay your doctor. Really? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. That great. Yeah, yeah. You'd bloody work out what worked, wouldn't you? Uh, I, I mean, just it's re- refreshing that yeah. a doctor uh, like you that you're out there because most people, you know, you just look around and you think. Doctors, I mean, ultimately, doctors should be saying, stop smoking, stop being an idiot, and just go and exercise. Mm. So you smoke, you have your addictions for a purpose. What is that purpose? Well, it's different for different people, but when you take on a habit, it's usually a way of coping with something else. So the addiction towards the cigarette, the alcohol, to whatever it was, served a purpose, but is also now causing damage in the long term. So people need to understand they weren't an idiot to start smoking. Because once you associate that behaviour with being an idiot, yeah. they just feel really stupid, don't they? Yeah. So you need to say, what you did was actually quite smart to fulfil the needs you had yeah. some years ago. What are those needs? You know what those needs are and why you started smoking or why you started drinking or, or eating like this. Yeah. And work out what those needs are and now how can you, how can you meet those needs in a healthy way? If you okay, if you were recommending people to be addicted to one thing, <laughs> what would you tell them to get addicted to? Oh well, as a, a CrossFit gym uh, owner, that, <laughs> that's a loaded question. Because I'm not saying anything. Yeah, I mean, being addicted to exercise is is is, um, is, is one of the would be one of the better addictions. But exercise. It, it, yeah, but addiction any kind really addictions re- reflecting unmet needs yeah so go in and find out what the needs are and, and meet those because sometimes it's incredibly simple i'm not addicted to anything what does that say about me <laughs> you're free oh that's cool i thought you were gonna say something else like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah yeah a, um, bi- a big thing to understand is that the vast majority of chronic disease which is the vast majority of the health burden we have in society did not occur in society a couple of hundred years ago so it is the way we're living life now that is bringing about those problems so those problems occur gradually that you don't suddenly go from one day to the next oh i've got type 2 diabetes yeah you can see biomarkers you can see well, you can you can do blood tests that will show that process is active 10 years before mm. you actually get a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Mm. First of all, the changes in the body in the disease process are reversible, and then they become irreversible. So if you just put it in a simple system, initially you're developing inflammation, and then you're developing fibrosis. Okay? So inflammation will be you know, the gathering of cells in a certain area trying to, to fight off a problem, yeah? And then at some point, that fighting leaves scarring. And the body says, well, you know what? We, we can't win. Uh, we're not going to remain in healthy tissue anymore. Yeah, we've, we've chucked everything we can at this. We're now just going to fibros. We're going to be a scar because a scar is better than a complete falling apart. Yeah. yeah? When, you, when you've got to scarring and fibrosis, you're not going to reverse that. Okay? Mm-hmm. But once you're in the inflammation phase, you can reverse. Yeah? So we've got to understand and work with it as a society to say an awful lot of the chronic disease, well, first of all, it's come from the lifestyle, from the exposures we've had. Yeah? 
um, some of which we've chosen, some of which we haven't chosen. But we can reverse that process. Yeah. So there's a huge amount of health that could be regained in society. You're not fixed and set. And that's the trouble with the, the Western medicine approach is it, it, it focuses so, so little on the reversal of chronic disease. Just take this pill. Take this pill, but you know you, you need a complex, integrated approach. Yeah. So you you know if you want someone to to lose weight, y- y- you've got a big picture to convey to them. Yeah? You've got to yeah. understand why they're eating, what they're eating. They've got to see about the quality of the food. They've got to have the money to access the quality of food. Um, they've got to understand what it is that they're going to be gaining from the food, yeah. how these different nutrients work in their body. Yeah. And I, I, the other day I was sort of, I thought oh, I'll write a little something on, on the a calorie is a calorie and uh, eat, uh, eat less, move more. Yeah. These sort of two sort of mantras of, yeah. of health, health loss and why they haven't worked. Yeah. And I sort of yeah. came up with a list of about 20 basic physiological facts about food that, don't work with that model and yeah. that's why that model doesn't work but it can work we can change those things yeah that's the beauty of the body isn't it it's a ma- amazing oh, it's thing. incredible yeah it's phenomenal but you just remind me of Jake, ricky Gervais again I, I watched it like, twice I watched it the other day. <laughs> and he's like the guy you know he's like lifting on a crane at his house and he's like if you're lifting on a crane at your house and you see immediately film you you know you fucked it I haven't seen <laughs> you don't see that no, no. <laughs> i saw the first bit of it but it, it is a bit like yeah, I mean, it all can be reversed. It will take a while, but I, I do... Like, it's like money. That can be reversed. We don't have to live in that system that we didn't opt yeah. you know, opt to live in. So I feel like health is one of those. Um, but yeah, I th- you know, I, I just think the internet will change it. I think the next generation's on it way more than we were, for, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Way more than we were. So... I do have hope in that. How old are your kids? What's the oldest and youngest? 21, my oldest stepson, and 10 as the youngest. Yeah. And do you see them, like, switched on to things? Um, little, little ways. Yeah. Little ways. Um, I bet the 21-year-old's got Bitcoin, hasn't he? Uh, I don't think he's got Bitcoin. I bet he has. Uh, I'd be surprised. He hasn't told you. <laughs> <laughs> You just turn yeah. up in a Lambo and you're like, what the hell? And you're like... Yeah, I'm sure he'll surprise me one day on, on some things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, I was thinking, you know, he, he's at uni, he's at art school, he's not getting out of bed until three o'clock in the afternoon. You know who you are, Yuri. <laughs> um, and then suddenly, okay, I'm organising myself. I'm doing this. I want to pursue what I want to pursue. I'll do this for the... In the meantime, he's getting on with, with doing his art and yeah. doing those little projects and sort of doing design for different people, album covers, all kinds of stuff. And something would have clicked. He'd have seen something that red pilled him and changed it. And that's what happens with money. That's what happens with health. People, yeah. people will see something that inspires them. Like what you said in that video inspired millions of people to talk about it. Yeah. Because yeah. they, you know, no matter how you look at it, I know you probably think, oh, no, I don't know, I didn't, you know, I just said whatever. But millions of people, I'm one of them, that was like, I shared the video. I was like, yeah. now what? Yeah. Now what? Right? Look, this guy is like clearly like smart. He's got common sense. He's talking to that idiot that runs <laughs> London, you know. <laughs> I had to pay three congestion charges. So so it's it's yeah, 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 idiot, basically. Um, and I was like, now what? So it's like when you when you actually think about what you did, millions of people were affected by it in mm. a really good way. And you you basically not single handedly, but you <laughs> saved like hundred thousand jobs and potential. You potentially save people's lives. Not to sound like an ad for the government, but by not getting the jab, one of those people might might have died from it. And you know, when you look back in twenty years, I think you you're like a what, what proper dude? What's <laughs> cheers, John? <laughs> what to me is quite incredible is that the conversation you can just have at home or with when you meet up with your friends, where you talk common sense, when that happens to have the opportunity to have a wide audience, it yeah. can be really game changing. I'm not talking about Netflix. Let's not go into that thing. 
um, but it can really change the situation. And so what I would say is, th- for me, what I hope was that I was an example for myself and for others that you can change the situation when you speak up and say what's what. And if we all do that all the time, that's how things change. I agree. Should we end it on that? Yeah, I think that's a nice one, John. Yeah, yeah that's cool. But you are a proper dude. <laughs> and thanks for um, thanks for finally talking to me. I'm glad that we talked now instead of yeah. like when it was all happening because I think our conversation might have been a bit more different, mm, a right. bit more like yeah. urgent and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm super happy that you came in, and it's really good to meet you. And uh, yeah, I'm you know I keep following what you're doing and stuff and. I Jeez, might even yeah. meditate after this. Yeah, I've yeah. never done it. I tried yeah. once, but I was like, I think my phone went off. <laughs> Hello, I'm meditating. <laughs> <laughs> it's not helping. But no, maybe you can teach me about that stuff. But yeah, sure. thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Proper dude. Thanks very much. Thanks, man. Cheers. See you in a bit. <laughs>